Okay, well, welcome everybody. So glad to be here with you tonight um, for this chat, this little workshop we'll have on community safety beyond policing. Uh, I'm Mary Zirkel from the American Friends Service Committee's Chicago Peace Building Program. And I also coordinate the, the initiative, uh, Community Safety Beyond Policing, um, which is sort of more of a nationally focused group of work around policing. So excited to share some thoughts with you tonight and get, just kind of get your impressions about some of these issues as well. Um, and I don't know, uh, Bill, if you have any housekeeping that you want to share with people? Is there anything? Uh, not really. I think um, we're doing fine here. Um, so I'm going to leave it in your capable hands. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so uh, in general, we can use, I'm going to invite you to use the chat to kind of have a conversation back and forth, but there may be points where we want to unmute as well, but be mostly um, using the chat until we get to the small group portion of the evening. So welcome and let's jump in with just sort of a question to get us thinking. So where are all the places that you see policing in your community? Can you go ahead and think about that and pop it into the chat? Where do you see policing in your community? And there's probably lots of places. On your block. Thank you, Melissa. How about other folks? Traffic, roads, green light system at gas stations all around. Walking in the downtown village where you live, bringing people to court often after domestic violence incidents in schools. Yep, definitely in schools. Circle K, railroad crossings. Yeah, so police are in many, many different aspects of our society. I saw, the last time I saw uh, police was last night, there's a uh, unhoused person in my neighborhood who's been sleeping outside my building and my neighbors and I are, have, made a commitment not to call the police on this person, but um, somebody else did. And they, they came and woke the person up and asked them to leave uh, just last night. County building jail. <clears throat> yeah. So you see, you know, police taking lots of different roles, being in lots of different aspects of our communities. And I think, oops, 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 oops. Um, I think some communities, you know, experience this much uh, differently, you know, than other communities. And, and I wonder if, um, if people just have thoughts about like what this image means. Um, anybody, what you could unmute or you could share in the chat, like what this, what you see in this image. Any thoughts? Did somebody want to unmute there? Uh, what one could say, a police force which has connections in the community versus a military type approach. Yeah, that could be one interpretation. I, I on the left hand side, I don't see any police, which is like, that's like a, a different sort of thing there. Thank you for sharing that though. Yeah, certain areas get policed more than others, which could go to what you were just saying. Yeah. What do, what do other folks think? You know, I see that. I, I, yes, I see go ahead. Police, as long as the building is being maintained, it be, appears to be being used. Um, but as soon as the building begins to look damaged, then the police are there. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. There's a whole uh, sort of theory of policing called broken windows policing, yeah, actually. No. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was going to Yeah, gonna... it... yeah were you, was somebody going to mention that too? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Other, other thoughts? Uh, yes. Uh, someone wrote in the chat, confrontation. Yeah. Uh, this police officer. Um, Basically, that is, in my opinion, the culture of the police force 
versus a culture of um, a cultural of controlling their trauma mm. when they walk into a situation. Yeah. Ooh, you bring up some really important points there. Yeah, definitely. Um, there, yeah, and we will get into this, but yeah, being able to control your trauma, your feelings in a situation when you have a lethal weapon is like a big part of this whole discussion we'll be having tonight. And I should say, you know, content warning, we will be talking uh, about police violence necessarily in the in this discussion. So uh, just a warning it in case that's sensitive for you. But yeah, I think, <clears throat> you know, everything that people have brought up in this image um, uh, is exactly right. And Bill just made a, asked a good question. Is the community center closed on the right side, less services? And that I think brings up something too, is like communities experience policing differently um, based on a lot of different things. It could be, well, name some of what those things are. Like right now we're talking about resources. So maybe the community center on the right has been, de you know, has, has been disinvested. Nobody's put money into that community for that community center for a while. It's starting to look run down. Maybe, you know, it doesn't even, it isn't even open. It might be abandoned where the one on the left looks like it's in a well-resourced community. And, uh, you know, there's no police because it's vibrant. People are in and out of there all the time, et cetera. Um, anybody, other thoughts about like how, what other factors might make um, communities experience policing differently? You can pop Race, it into the chat. Sure. Yeah, race, definitely. I wouldn't yeah. say race. I would say racism. Racism. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Fair. Yeah. In, yeah, many exactly. in many respects, I'm surprised to see the police officer in front of the abandoned building. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes, once the buildings are abandoned, everybody abandons them, including law enforcement. Mm-hmm clear out drug dealers and people who are squatting mm, mm -hmm. homeless etc yeah yeah that's a good point <clears throat> and it just sort of depends on the situation because sometimes um they're there to sort of like police the people in the community uh versus you know trying to protect them or whatever um but yeah there's a lot every community is different and and the, the, all everything you said just revealed so much. My friend Lewis Webb, who I, I usually do these workshops um, with, we're double teaming tonight. He's doing a different workshop and I'm doing this because luckily there's so many people interested in this topic, but he likes to do this spectrum. So if you look at the spectrum um, where you have, who's all the way on the left? Anybody recognize those folks? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I recognize them. I can't remember their names. Andy and uh, what was the other guy's Barney, name? Barney, Barney, um, Barney, 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 Barney. Right, and very RFD. Everybody's lovable, you know, police guys. So if they're if that's one end of the spectrum, and then all the way on the right are you know this is um, an image from the murder of George George Floyd. If you look at that spectrum, like pop into the chat where where would you see your community you know your experience with the police on the spectrum it was just based on your own experience in the community where you live you know it um i live in st clair shores michigan just north of detroit and mm -hmm. um we have a good police department usually um, the only problems that we have around here are it makes a difference what ra what race you are. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I can I can tell all oh, the police if I had a flat tire they they turn you know they would do it for me whatever right uh, but <laughs> hey I'm very light <laughs> and, yeah uh, yeah it, that's a it makes a huge difference and it has to be fought every day yeah, uh, yeah. not fought violently you know but I mean yeah yeah yeah. yeah. <laughs> And there are, I think that's a really good point. And, you know, I think there are other ways that there are other identities that people hold that, that uh, where they're also criminalized and we can get into that more as we 
talk. I wonder if anybody just has a story about a time when you called the police and like what happened, or maybe you maybe you were, were around when somebody else called the police. Um, and just you know, share if any, anybody want to share a story about something that happened that they witnessed or that they were part of. It could be good, bad, or indifferent. It doesn't have to be a terrible thing. I do these. I ask this workshop, but or ask this question in all my workshops, and the answers are different. You know, just based on lots of different things. Anybody have something they would want to share? Um, I'm not sure that I'm. I think I can be heard, but I'm not doing so well with the visuals. Um, what I'm going to share is that, uh, and this is a fairly small village, but this was an incident that then helped to kick off our reform committee. Uh, mm. for the police. Um, a man who was emotionally disturbed and threatening suicide. His mother called the police, mm -hmm. not wanting to make sure he wasn't hurt. Um, and a, an adult man, but he had a gun. So they called the police and it soon turned into a war zone. I mean, mm. the SWAT teams and all the, you know, the house surrounded and they would not want, let the mother continue to talk to the son. They just completely... Mm excluded her. Anyway, it turned into a terrible tragedy in which he did kill himself and the entire neighborhood was like a war zone. And that was just one of those kinds of experiences that then led, and this is in Yellow Springs, Ohio, which is a very pretty small village to people saying, we need to do some reform about the police, mm -hmm. including never let the SWAT team in our village. So Yeah, wow, wow, that's, in, I'm so sorry to hear that. And unfortunately, it's a story that's all too familiar <clears throat> um, with those mental health responses. I'm sorry that that happened. Thank you for sharing that. Anybody else have a story that they'd like to share? I was fortunate to work for a while with a semi-retired sheriff's deputy who was fortunately on the Andy Griffith side of things. And he was chosen to work with diversion for that reason. We had spent the whole day working with people uh, doing community service and leading by example. He and I were both working, digging right along with people, working in a community garden. And on the way home, he was passing back sandwiches to the young people that he had made and brought. And uh, one of the young men who was African-American was having, helping to pass the sandwiches back. And he said, I never met a cop like you. You know what? Cops' lives do matter. <laughs> His name was Daryl, and I wish we had lots more Daryls in the world. Wow, that's that's quite a story. Yeah, yeah. I think um, you know, there's so many different ways that communities, depending on your identity, depending on who you are, you get to interact with uh, police and have different experience, and it's so complex. I mean, I'm going to share a story as being a victim of crime that happened from my own own life. Uh, where I was in Chicago, just walking home from the movies with my partner and um, was held up at gunpoint. This is in the late 90s, um, like gun into my chest kind of thing. And um, the, it was a young 13 year old boy um, and took my bag and, you know, got back to the apartment, we're pretty shaken up and freaking out and called the police. And um, they came right away, asked for a description, which we couldn't really give much of a description it was dark and we were freaked out <laughs> but we said like okay young african-american maybe 13 year old kid and they said okay all right we'll be right back and like maybe 20 minutes later they um came back and they said go to your dining room window and we will look out the dining room window and they had grabbed maybe a dozen young african-american kids you know from the neighborhood just probably any kid they saw walking down the street and put them all in a lineup underneath our dining room window under the street light. And we're really pressuring us to identify somebody, which we could not do. There was no way we were gonna identify. I mean, it was just not. And it felt horribly violent. Like I've just felt terrible to be implicated in this incident, you know, it just felt really bad. And so we really, uh, cause they were putting a lot of pressure on us and we just held steady and we're just like no sorry we can't do it and they left very disappointed but they told us to come to the um police station the next day to look at some mug shots 
I hope all those kids got home all right that night because I don't know what they did with them after. But so we did go to the police station the next day and the mug shots were high school yearbooks from the area high schools. So they, they further criminalized, like that night they criminalized any young African-American kid. And in this giving me the high school yearbook, they, they basically said any kid who goes to Roosevelt High School is a potential criminal. You could identify, you know. Uh, and so again, that, uh, that incident left us feeling like, wow, not only did we not feel better about having this crime <laughs> you know, or like feel any kind of resolution from, you know, having this violent incident happen to us the night before. In fact, we just feel terrible that we even bothered calling the police in this situation. So I think, you know, we, we all have different experiences and I think the spectrum is real, right? Because there's lots of people, I know many people that I talk to in having these conversations, know people in their lives where they love, who they know are good people who serve in law enforcement, right? And it's kind of, you think about the same thing with the, the military, that people have people in their lives who are part of that as well. And so we can think about individuals and that makes a lot of sense, but we can also think about systems and how systems reinforce in various you know, inequalities, et cetera. Um, but thank you so much for that conversation. That was really good. I'm gonna now just share this little video um, uh, of my colleague, Lewis Webb speaking, he is the director of our healing justice work in um, AFSC. And he, he just really brings a good perspective and frames things really well. So because I'm missing his presence here tonight, I wanted to just let him share a couple words with you. So I'm gonna share this video. And there are images. So my name is Lewis here. and I want to re-welcome you all to this train the trainer session on how to talk to your communities and your loved ones about a world without policing. We've all been exposed to the calls to defund the police and to envision community safety, the safety to, that does not include policing. And these are very important conversations for us all to have. I, I think the challenge that we face, however, is who's part of the conversation. Very often our communities are very similar to us and so we have these conversations without having the full story in front of us. So what I'm hoping to do with, with this presentation is to bring a perspective that might not be at your tables when you're having these conversations or in your community meetings. And it's my perspective. It's the perspective of a black man born and raised in New York City who's had the pleasure of raising three young black men. And when we think about policing and the calls to, um, to, to defund the police and otherwise vision a world without policing, it has a very unique and important meaning to me and my community. That, that meaning is really informed both by the history of policing in the United States and the current realities that I and my children and my community face. So I, I, I welcome the opportunity to share that perspective with you and hope that you receive it in the spirit of um, usefulness and, and that when you do have the conversations that we are helping you prepare for, that um, the perspective of all people are given space and, um, and heard. And so, you know, when, when I think about policing, I, um, I, I'm forced to look at its history. And it's not a very pleasant history for members of the black community. It, it, it's one that originates with slavery. The slave pr patrols were one of the clearest ways to maintain our lack of humanity. The slave owners and created this force called slave patrols to, um, to make sure that we remained in slavery. It, threatened us, it captured us, it beat us, and it killed us, all to support the institution that, um, that has been part of our history for all too long. So understanding policing with that perspective brings me to a, um, a difficult place. It is super hard to appreciate what policing is supposed to be when its origin for my community is so horrific. That origin, you know, certainly feeds and 
dominates the policing of today in black and brown communities. They're not the officer friendly that many of us or many of you, I suspect, may have experienced both growing up and currently in your very different communities in the Bronx, New York. For us, police are often an occupying force, a force that is here to control us, to um, dehumanize us, and to stymie our sense of hope. And it does a very good job, unfortunately. Now, we, we can certainly talk statistics and um, lift up some of the most horrific and well-publicized stories behind the abuses of policing in, in the inner city. But I think it's also important to talk about the untold stories, those day-to-day -day realities that I and my children have lived. I've, I'm raising three young men, two have entered adulthood and one is struggling through the early stages of teenagehood. But in all of their realities, policing has not been the most positive experience. And, and so what I'd like to share with you over the next few minutes is just some of those examples of why I and we join the call to defund the police and urge us all to really strongly envision a world where our community struggles are not responded to by an occupied armed force, but by a spirit of transformation and healing that um, will truly ensure community well-being and, and the safety that we all strive for. So the first story I'd like to share is one that um, reminds me of how early in the lives of my children policing showed up. And, and it was when my um, then 14 year old son shared with me that he does not understand why I and many others are fighting stop and frisk. He, he said to me that um, that's what police do. It's their responsibility to keep us safe and the way they do it is to make sure that we're not doing anything wrong. You know, and to hear that, to hear the perspective that police are there to monitor them. It, it's hard for a parent to hear. It's, it's, hard for, um, it's hard for us to respond to because that's not the officer friendly that many of us have come to think about when we think about law enforcement. It is a, um, it is a challenge to your humanity. It is a challenge to your value to society where you have to live in a community where you are inundated with police forces that don't trust you and monitor you and randomly stop you and, and challenge your existence. That's why we have to reimagine policing in the United States because too many young black men, young black children are experiencing this world in a way that um, that leaves them feeling less less valued than they should. I also have an older son who many years ago experienced policing in a very different way. It's it's what we call now the school to prison pipeline. But to be searched essentially by police every day when he went to school is is one more example of how policing shows up in my community. And as you all go into these conversations, it's important to understand that the policing that you know is very different than the policing that I and my children know. To be told that you cannot even enter your school without being checked is one more indicator that policing is designed to control and dehumanize young black men. And it works. You know, it, it works. And the legacy of that is one that is frightening to all of us. My youngest son, who's 13 and experiencing all of the challenges of entering young adulthood, um, biological challenges, social challenges, and in the midst of a pandemic, is at the point where mom and dad don't have all the answers, but yet he has all the questions. And as, as we've all experienced the um, horrific killing of George Floyd, he came to us and he said, you know, what, what's going on? Why do the police hate us so much? That's the reality that many 
members of my community are experiencing on a daily basis. And so as you go into these conversations, these important conversations around policing and the possibility of a world where it doesn't exist the way it does now, I just ask you to welcome this perspective to those conversations, to give it space and to take the steps necessary to ensure that policing as you experience it need not be as different as the policing that I and my children experience. Because, you know, that's not the world that I want to live in. And I, I trust it's not one we all want. So thank you for this opportunity to be heard and to bring a perspective that might not show up in your community and family conversations. Let, let, let's, let's do it, guys. Let's, let's get to a place where we can care for each other without the need for the dangers of policing as it often shows up. And I wanna thank you and um, would welcome future conversations and ways to contribute to this effort. So on behalf of AFSC, thank you. And um, we look forward to hearing how those conversations go. You're muted, Mary. So my name is Lewis, and I want Mary, you're on mute. Okay. I did it. Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I'm glad you're able to um see Lewis's uh, little video there and it might sound strange because he keeps talking about conversations. We originally recorded that for workshops we were doing that were training people to have community conversations around these topics. But it's, I think even though this is a more general workshop, I think he has some great perspectives to, to share. Um, so yeah, just I wanted to share like a couple things that ground AFSC's work around policing um, before we sort of start to get into like, well, what do we do instead then? I, I wanna really talk about some concrete uh, things we can do instead of calling the police. And you know, we're not just trying to give you some grand theory and not uh, connect it to real world things, but some, some aspects that uh, ground uh, AFSC's work in this are that our healing justice work in AFSC, and I'm gonna share more about that toward the end of the presentation, but we're grounded in the analysis that the prison industrial complex, um, you know, is something that needs to be dismantled. And what we mean by the prison industrial complex is the overlapping interests of government and industry that use surveillance, policing, and imprisonment as solutions to economic, social, and political problems. And that comes from a group called Critical Resistance that we work with and, and really respect their uh, framing of these issues. And I like this graphic for this definition because it kind of shows, again, the way if we go back to that original uh, image of the two different sides of the community center, if we have a system where we're spending billions of dollars on policing in this country every year to the detriment of other things we could be spending money on that helps communities in different ways, um, you know, many communities are in a situation that Ruthie Wilson Gilmore calls organized abandonment. Many communities, you know, have money's been taken out of uh, the schools, taken out of healthcare, taken out of job creation, et cetera. Um, and then you end up with folks who are in poverty, who are houseless, you have mental health issues maybe that are being untreated, drug addiction. And what happens then? Those folks become criminalized by all of those conditions rather than. Uh, you know, funding going toward things that would help them move out of that. Instead, we're putting Monday money into prisons, surveillance, and policing. It starts this vicious cycle. And so AFSC is actively working to dismantle, you know, in a very long-term way, the prison industrial complex. And one of the ways that we're working to do that, and Melissa, if you would put that, um, the first link up into the chat, one of the ways, one of the strategies that we are part of um, is the strategy to invest and divest. And so we wanna reduce reliance on policing and envision alternatives. And that means we wanna encourage governments to take money out of policing and instead invest in the things that really help 
communities thrive and that again, that communities really need. And Melissa put a, a, a link into the chat there that's from the platform for Black Lives. AFSC endorsed this policy platform, I think in 2015. Uh, and so we've been modeling our work on this idea of invest, divest for a long period of time. We need to shift our priorities. This is very akin to many Quakers, right? Our war tax resistors have a critique of the military budget being too huge, where lots of social services and human needs go unfunded. This is very similar. And in fact, in Chicago, this banner uh, is in this picture is a little action we did in Chicago because we did an analysis of the Chicago police bud budget and found to our dismay <laughs> that $5 million per day goes to the police every single day in our budget. This is the same city where 54 public schools were closed within one year and six mental health clinics under the Rahm Emanuel administration. And the fallout of that disruption within communities has been horrible. Uh, so it's like a very stark in our community how uh, the city government has chosen to uh, make choices around our city budget. And uh, we don't think it's working. And in fact, most of the, most of the general public, there was a city sponsored budget survey uh, two years ago. Maybe, maybe it was a year ago. I think maybe it was two years ago. But 87% of the people who responded to the survey said they wanted less money going to policing when you look at $5 million a day. But that principle of invest divest is important because the invest part is, is just as important as the divest. We don't wanna say, let's take all the money away from the police and not have something to replace a system that's been in place for, for a very long time. Like we need to build up other alternatives and ways to keep each other safe. Um, and so that's just as important. And so we can talk about what some of those things are. One of the biggest things that's happening uh, these days is that there's state funding. This is really great. There's a lot of state funding that's going toward building up mental health crisis response units that are um, have no police co-responders, but instead they have a mental health professional and they have a peer responder. So somebody who's had mental, who's been in mental health crisis themselves, who's been trained and works with the mental health professional. AFSC is working with some of these uh, spots in Chicago and other places. And um, it's a very exciting opportunity to you know, create safety for people who are in crisis. Um, so they, these alternatives are happening. We can see, we can see that new, new ways of being can, can happen. So uh, <clears throat> this is the part where we get concrete. So I just wanted to give sort of that grounding, share some of our experiences and our ideas, but then what do we do instead, right? <laughs> What 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 do we what do we want to make sure that people have concrete strategies, methods, ideas, uh, and maybe even some safety plans in place uh, to avoid calling the police? And um, I developed some of these ideas in my community in Chicago because um, the FSC is part of a, a big mutual aid hub that developed during the pandemic, where we. Um, give, uh, we distribute food and us, uh, other household supplies to people in the community that need it. And all of the volunteers as part of this project make a commitment not to call the police. And I came in with my AFSC hat at that point and said, well, we have to like, we have to develop some things people can do instead. And so we've been doing this for two years and it's, it's worked out pretty well. So I'm gonna share some of these things with you. So this is a little problem tree. Like if you are in a situation uh, where you're thinking, oh, I don't know what to do in this situation. I might call the police. The first question you could ask yourself is, wait a second, do I really need to call the police? Or is this kind of a, more like an inconvenience and I can kind of deal with it? Can anybody think of it like probably one of the biggest kind of inconvenient thing that people call the police for? Any thoughts? Noise. Yes, 100%. Party next door. Somebody's playing their stereo too loud, et cetera. Yeah, that's a really... You know, it might be unpleasant. It might be keeping you up, but do I need a lethally armed person to respond to the situation or not? Can we think of any other examples? A suspicious person. Mm-hmm. A suspicious person, and it depends on what makes that person suspicious. Is it because they're breaking into your car or is it because they're of a different race or they look different and you're not used to seeing people in your space like that, right? You can think of examples like the Central Park murder, et cetera, um, where it was merely the person's race that made them 
seem threatening or suspicious to the to the person calling the police. So once you've kind of figured out, okay, yeah, you know, maybe I can just deal with that. That ends the that ends the thing. And a lot of people just don't ask themselves that question. Um, but if you do think, hey, you know what, I actually do need to respond to this situation, then you can kind of go to the next question that you can ask yourself. Just think, can I actually just deal with this myself by talking it through with the other person? Um, and I think in my experience of doing these workshops over the last few years, one of the big reasons why, and I can say myself that I'm in the same group, why people end up calling the police or really think about it is that they feel like kind of scared to, either they don't know their neighbors in a certain situation and they don't want to like deal with getting to know this person and maybe having like an uncomfortable conversation, something like that. But also maybe they just don't feel like they know what to do in this situation because maybe the person's agitated or something and you don't, you just don't know if you have the skills to handle the situation. But, you know, maybe you can go next door and knock on the door and say, hey, you know, my kid's sleeping. Would you mind turning the, the music down? It might work out just fine. Um, what we train folks in our uh, community to do is just some really basic, and we're doing deeper de-escalation training later this summer, but something you can just keep in your brain if you ever have a situation like this are the three Ds. So verbal de-escalation, if it's a tense situation, it can you can get it in, you can make the situation better and sometimes work it out just between people. If you use any of these things like distract. So if the, in my community, we have, um, there's again, because the mental health clinics were closed in Chicago. There's a lot of people who experience mental illness who are around in the community and, and can prevent, can create challenges sometimes in situations. And so um, one of the things we do is just try to like, you can distract, distract somebody who's maybe agitated or creating a disturbance or something. Sometimes being distracting is actually being kind to the person instead of escalating it and be like, hey, get out of here. I mean, you know, that kind of escalates something. But if you go up to the person and you're like, hey, I notice, you know, hey, hey, can I get you a drink of water? I've got some snacks in my house. Would you like a snack, you know, or, you know, just kind of like being kind to them uh, often goes a long way toward kind of chilling out the situation. Um, you can distract somebody also by telling a joke, like, hey, it's kind of crazy that you're out here right now, you know, I don't know, just making light of the situation, engaging the person. Um, and a lot of times that'll just like calm the situation down. Um, you can also be direct with the person and just be like, hey, uh, I, I know that you're out here making this noise, but I just need to be very clear. I just can't have you doing that right now. One of the tricks that um, uh, actually one of the peer responders that I know who works with one of these mobile crisis units um, she's used this a number of times and I haven't used it yet, but she said it's very effective is sometimes um, people who might be creating a, a situation like this are so used to people calling the police on them. If you tell the person like, look, I'm not gonna call the police on you, but somebody else might, that that is actually has been effective for her of the person being like, okay, like respect, I'm grateful you're not gonna call the police on me they like they hear that and that's a kindness to them and then they also are like wow but maybe actually somebody else might you know um and then the third one is um or the other thing with direct is we're always like telling people in the mutual aid spaces like hey you can't be here if you don't put your mask on you have to have a mask on you know just making being clear what the rules are for being in this space um delegate is the last one which is like sometimes it's not good to have a one-on-one -on -one interaction with somebody that can escalate it more and if there's if you have a friend or a neighbor who's nearby maybe approach the person with somebody else or if it's not if your interaction isn't working with the person maybe uh you know enlist somebody to go and try to continue the conversation without you um so those are just some basic ideas there's a lot of skill involved in de-escalation but i like things that are quick because i know when I'm in a situation where I feel you, you, you get your own auto, uh, your own like nervous system gets kind of ginned up when you're in a situation like this, where you feel a little scared, maybe heart, heart beating a little bit. And I like the tricks where it's like, oh, the three Ds, what is that? So I don't have to like try to think too much. I just, I have a simple trick. Um, yeah, anybody else have like de-escalation tactics that they know just from their lives or that they've tried that 
kind of can help chill out a situation in a in an interaction with somebody that maybe you don't even know any any thoughts practical advice people have sometimes people just want to be heard and just asking an open question beautiful what's up sometimes just knowing that if you stay calm and you're making it clear that you really do want to hear their perspective on what's going on sometimes that takes the tension level way down that's great i love that so much it's so important listening right mm -hmm. that's just a basic like human respect thing that a lot of people don't get you know and um and that's such a great thank you for that addition i really love that sometimes just something surprising I, mean, mm -hmm. I was on the bus. I was on the bus the other day, and the man in front of me started screaming and yelling at the bus driver because the bus driver said he still owed sixteen cents, and he said he'd put all the money. You know, a, a mm -hmm. really trivial thing, but it was getting to the point where the bus driver was turning on his radio to call headquarters to come to have the police. I don't. I don't know if he was really calling the police, but he was threatening right. that that was going to happen. And I just looked in my wallet and handed the guy two dimes, and he sort of. <laughs> was startled and said oh and went and put it in, in the bus thing and and he Yay. kept muttering he kept muttering under his breath but it didn't escalate he didn't scream he got off the bus at the next stop which was where he was going anyway um, that's great but you know it sort of just broke the pattern a little bit exactly you've toned it down you solved the problem and that was a beautiful solution thank you for sharing that i love that rosemary were you going to say something you know sometimes it's possible to um, kind of identify with the other person's problem. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you one quick incident. Many years ago, I had a neighbor who was very much annoyed that the cats that some of the rest of us had were pooping in his garden. And he sent several of us a really threatening note. And, uh, and my son and, and the son of the neighbor said, you want us to do, do something? And I said, no, no, <laughs> give, me, give me a chance. And what I did was I wrote him, um, I think I wrote him a sonnet, actually. But basically, it said, uh, you know, neighbors do annoy each other. And sometimes you just have to deal with it. And the comparison I made was, you know, some neighbors don't like the cats. And other neighbors park on the street when they're not allowed to, which was something that he did. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I rolled, you know, kind of folded it up and put it on the windshield of his car underneath the wiper so that as he walked home from work, which was up the hill, he would see it and his first thought would be, oh, my God, a ticket, you know, mm. uh, instead of which it was my little note about neighbors, you know, looking out for each other. And he immediately, I was peeking out the curtains in my son. <laughs> And he, um, he turned around and he came up to my uh, door, knocked on the door, and I opened it. And he said, Rosemary, I'm sorry. And wow. we hugged each other. And he went home. And that was the end of that. So. I love that story. That's so great. And I really want to emphasize, you know, you, you all bring up such beautiful points. I really think that that is such a huge thing is like, I think and the pandemic worsened this. I think we're so, in many communities, we're so separate from each other. We don't really know our neighbors. I mean, I live in a big city. I've lived in this neighborhood for 18 years. And it wasn't until I started to do mutual aid work that I really started to meet my neighbors because I might know the people in my building or a couple people down the street, but you know, I didn't, I didn't know that person that I see every day walking down the street who wears a parrot on her shoulder, but now I do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and it was, just, but I think that this has a lot to do with why we sometimes get scared and don't know how to interact. Because if, if I know Sharon, the lady who has the parrot on her shoulder and I, and I see a situation where I need to talk to her, I can talk to her now, you know? Um, so I love that story, Rosemary. Thank you for sharing that. Um, all right. So yeah, if you, if you've tried the de-escalation strategy and you're like, hey, this is not working. I've tried all, all of my little 3Ds, but I need some backup now. There's, so here's the next sort of thing to ask yourself. Is, is there, and it says free store there, I'm sorry, because the free store is, is our mutual aid project where we give away household supplies and I developed this training for the free store. So I, I 
I forgot to change that. But is there is there somebody that you could call upon to kind of give you a little bit of backup? Is there a neighbor? Is there a friend? And um, one of the strategies I want to suggest to you all that we have done in Chicago, and the, it's grown quite large now, is in, again, in this one neighborhood where I live, which is the Rogers Park neighborhood of Chicago. It's a, it's a far north neighborhood in Chicago, but it's uh, unusually diverse for, for how segregated Chicago is um, and economically and racially diverse. There's 80 languages spoken in this particular neighborhood. But anyway, we've, a bunch of us who are around this mutual aid work started um, a little text thread and we use this app called Signal. I don't know if people know it. It's like an encrypted app, but you can, most people just have some kind of messaging app on their phones. And we just have a little text thread with everybody on there. And um, everybody who lives like close enough proximity that if there was a situation, I could text this thread and there would be, you know, 25 people who probably are in the area and who could respond to a situation. And um, we've used it a couple of times. Um, most recently, uh, there was somebody followed back at somebody followed a, a, a person who's part of our mutual aid hub uh, and was kind of threatening them. And I was at, I was in the the mutual aid hub with this person who was being threatened. We had to lock the door and we didn't know what to do, but we texted to this thread and a couple of people showed up. And really, they all they had to do was kind of show up and just ask this person like, hey, "What are you doing? What's up?" And then the person left. So there was no need for us to call the police. The whole thing was over in a second because we had this, this plan in place, you know? So you might consider it. Maybe it's just a couple of friends on your block where you're just like, hey, let's just, let's just, maybe nothing bad's gonna happen, but wouldn't it be nice if we all had a little thread just in case we need backup? It could be like, oh my God, my roof's leaking. Do you have a bucket? <laughs> or it could be something more serious, you know? Um, so that's one strategy that you might want to try out. Of course, there's going to be times where you're like, sorry, but, you know, uh, my friend Sheila across the street is not going to solve this problem. I actually really need a professional to help me in this situation. Um, so the first thing you want to figure out is, is it possible to call an emergency response hotline rather than the police? So this might be some homework you might want to do in your community. Um, lots of places. And there's actually, <coughs> I'm going to put this into the chat. Oh, shoot. I have to, I have to remember. I think it's called don'tcallpolice.com. I think that's what it is. Um, I'll follow up in, in an email to Bill and maybe he can share this with you. But there is a, a, um, a, a website that has tried to call this from communities across the, the nation. Like what are some of these hotlines that you can call instead? But you probably have to do your own homework anyway. I found when we're looking at the list, you know, in Chicago, Chicago is so huge. I just looked at my own neighborhood and found out who are the social services in the neighborhood? You know, there's housing services, there's mental health services, there's, um, you know, uh, L LGBTQ youth services, et cetera. And then I went and uh, with my friends in the mutual aid work, we called them up and just kind of just said, hey, you know, we're just curious about your service. You know, basically found out from them, do they call the police on people? Or is that a commitment that they are like trying to make sure that they're providing services and avoiding calling the police if at all possible? And then we figured out who are the people that we wanted to put in our hotline list. And that's uh, something that we can do in, in an emergency. We can be, we can connect somebody who's coming perhaps to the mutual aid hub for food or whatever. And they can, um, if they're having a crisis, mental health crisis, now we have this co-responder that's funded by the state, this 988 number. People may have heard this about the 988 number. So we do have people who would show up in a, in a mental health crisis. But we also could connect somebody with housing services to have a 24 hotline, 24 hour hotline or an LGBTQ uh, youth um, uh, crisis support system where they might chat with somebody. Maybe those people wouldn't show up, but we have a few options in that case. So developing this is another little strategy you could take. Yeah, hand. Beverly, you're on, on mute. I'm trying to get me unmuted. I'm not. Oh, you did it. Yeah, but I've got this line. I'm going to have to ask Bill how to straighten this thing out sometime soon. <laughs> um, I, what I'm thinking of is, um, and I, I'm working on a case right now. It's just tragic because the police showed up 
um, and the mother called. All right, what I'm thinking, we're making this shorter, is the family law, you know, family disputes, uh, not just neighbors, but the real, I mean, the police officers say they, that is the most deadly, um, most dangerous call they have. And mm -hmm. that, uh, it's so dangerous also to every family member and the structure of the family uh, once the police are involved. Yeah, yeah. Is there and any it, way that we can look yeah. toward trying to get that specifically handled? Or? Yeah, absolutely. And I know there are groups uh, that are doing it. In this second, we're gonna actually do some imagining exercises around various topics. Um, uh, but I know that there, there are lots of different, uh, we're in a period right now that's very exciting. People are really experimenting with how to create services and support and alternatives uh, to punishment around a lot of these different things in ways that are, um, they're new and exciting. And so, so glad you bring that up. That is definitely a crucial area. And it's not all neighbors just having disputes, you're right. Um, so we're, we're gonna kind of uh, do the imagining part in, in just a few. So, um, but you know, again, sometimes you're, you're gonna be in a situation where you're like, hey, the hotline is just not gonna cut it right now. And sometimes you might have to call the police. And so we, we, we wanna, we always tell people who are part of our mutual aid work, and I'm saying this to you now, hey, if somebody's having a heart attack, you need to call 911. The police are probably gonna show up, but you wanna save that per person's life. <laughs> you know, there are situations where you just have to end up doing it. And just like asking yourself that last question about like, wait, if, if I do this, do I understand how it may affect me and the other person? So like one of the things would be like, um, is it gonna criminalize this other person? You know, is it gonna create more problems for them than ultimately is gonna help them in the long run? Uh, that would be a thing. If you do have, end up having to call, you know, whenever you call 911, at least in a big city, they, they always send police. So if, if you ever do need to do that, you might wanna just warn people in proximity to say, hey, you know, I had to call 911 so the cops might show up. If, if you're somebody who's worried about that, you might wanna leave, you know, just giving them that knowledge. Um, but the truth is, you know, there are very few systems available outside of 911 and 311. We do now have this 988 number, which is so great, but we need to work together to build these alternatives. And just as you were talking about Beverly, like imagine these things, what, what could be some different ways of approaching these problems? And Pam, I see your hand. Pam, did you wanna make a comment or question? Did I lose Pam? Oh, I can't hear you. Are you? There we go. Oh, we can't hear you. Bill, do you have any, any ideas what's going on with Pam? She's unmuted, but we're still not hearing her. So maybe her microphone's got issues. Hmm. Pam, you know what you could do? Why don't you type your comment or your question into the chat? My apologies for that. And I saw that Pat's hand was up. Yes, I wondered uh, when you were talking about the, the thread, you know, where you have neighbors mm -hmm. or friends, people you can call. I was thinking how it's different, how you're received differently, um, perceived differently if you're white or you're black. And I mm -hmm. was wondering, is this like an interracial thread or mm -hmm. are, are there things, I mean, a black person is going to be more unsafe in that situation. Or is yeah. that addressed in uh, the kinds of things that are um, suggested to people to do? Yeah, that, thank you so much. That's a really thoughtful and smart question. Absolutely. And the, the thread is like my neighborhood interracial. So there are people with lots of different identities and lots of different ways on that thread. And so one of the things we always do, and I just mentioned it earlier, but when in all of our work together, we um, you know try to keep any kind of interaction with um, uh, law enforcement for sure, uh, making sure that the people who are the least likely to have violence or criminalization happen to them be the person to interact with law enforcement. So that's a great job for white people if that situation needs is developed. In a dangerous situation, 
um, you know, it, I think we just explain the situation and people just decide themselves on the thread if they feel safe or not responding to that situation. Luckily, it's it really hasn't, we, we've had to use it in a few, that situation I described when we were locked inside the space was probably the most like nerve wracking situation. And really all it took was a couple of people just rode up on their bikes and just asked the person what was, you know, hey, what's up and what, what, what are you doing here? And that the person left, you know? But I think that's a really important and good question. Yeah, thank you, Pat. And I think every community has to figure that out for themselves. Yes, who is? Mary. Yeah. It's Pam. Oh, I can, Pam, I can talk right. now. All Yay. right. <laughs> what I wanted to say was that in the 90s, there, Evanston had a program that was part of the community action policing. And mm -hmm. the idea was to do many of the things that you were talking about, to place policing more into the community rather than having to call the police every single time something happened. Yeah. And the police were trying very hard to initiate the program and get the community involved. And I went through the program and it was a mutual working between the department um, with citizens. And this was before the police became militarized and they were trying to deal with the influx of um, automatic and semi-automatic weapons that were coming into the Chicago area. Yeah. So there are programs that have existed in the past that take up some of the functions that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, I think there and are. Oh, let's go ahead. Chicago also for a while was doing something like this. In yeah. fact, again, it was back in the 90s. So yeah. that's what I'm a little bit more familiar with is the Chicago experience. And um, one of our partners, um, and then I see another hand, but one of our partners did an analysis of, um, it was called CAPS in Chicago, CAPS. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so what, what we found and what our partners found in that um, resource, and this is like, I, I would say my own personal experience of going to some of those meetings back in the day, um, is that it really is just a, uh, reinforced the racial divide because it'd be white property owners that would go to the, those meetings. And then they would just report on, you know, activity that they were worried about in the neighborhood that had to do with, you know, people loitering, you know, uh, things young people were doing that seemed threatening to them, et cetera. So in, in general, I mean, and I'm sure there, there are places in some communities where it's worked well. I think Chicago maybe was not one of them, but in general, AFSC are what we're trying to do. And this is, doesn't mean that this is what you all have to do, but I'll just share our own analysis. And what we're trying to do is trying to, um, work hard to reduce the scope of policing while we're building up again, these community-based alternatives or government funded alternatives that can help replace some of these functions. And we're really gonna get into this thinking about what some of these things can be in a second. But first I wanna give Patricia's iPad a chance to okay. chime in. Uh, <laughs> so you can hear me, I hope, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, I think it's important that in this conversation that we, uh, hold on to the insight that one of the things that we have done as a society is to dump serious social problems on the police. So homelessness, addiction, uh, you, family violence, you name it. And instead mm -hmm. of looking at it as a social problem, we look at it as a control mm -hmm. uh, uh, function of the police. We dump it on the police in yep. addition to controlling all people of color, of course. But I mean, we... Yep. I think that holding that up for people to see and reminding people, you get a little bit of compassion for the police, but also mm -hmm. you're, it points out to you that, you know, what is going on here, what we're doing as a society. And I did put in the chat that in our little village, and it's something really far away from Chicago, but we do have a police social worker half time. Oh, great. And that that was a recommendation to our village council that we do that to remove from the policing, some of the responding to those kinds of problems. And again, it's on a small scale, nothing like Chicago, but I do think we have to hold that, you know, this is what, this is, why do we have police? 
why do we have yeah it? <laughs> no it's huge i think that's such a good point and and in fact i wanted to talk about that a little bit so um yeah we basically we ask lethal, lethally armed police who in most cases do not have social service backgrounds or social work backgrounds to spend more than half of their time responding to non-criminal calls and traffic issues. So responding, as you mentioned, to a host of things that A, maybe you don't need a lethal weapon to respond to, and B, maybe you don't have the skills to actually help the situation. Another um, uh, study uh, found that probably about 4% of the time of an average police officer's time is spent four percent is spent responding to violent crime so that's like the thing that's the thing that we all get scared about and think about the most and again my experience being a person who had a violent crime happen to them my my situation was not satisfying (laughs) the police response to it so you know when you look at like the big the bigger scope of things i think you're right we do need to figure out like hey what are some different ways we can address this. So now this is the exciting part where we're going to, I'm going to, I'm a little bit ill prepared here because I forgot that I need to copy these. Um, Oh, shoot. Am I not going to be able to do this? Oh, wait. Oh yeah. Okay. Now I can. Um, Sorry for the ugliness of my PowerPoint here, but I I need to put these things in the chat, these questions in the chat, because we're going to go into small groups and Bill, I think Let's just try to do 10 small groups. So there'll just be a few people in each group, if that works. Um, uh, and what sure. you're gonna do when we, we get in there is, I'm gonna put these questions into the chat, which I just did. And um, so when you go in, if you were in group one, if you look up there, you see the first prompt, some folks are sleeping on benches in the park. That's the situation that you'll be discussing. And, um, and of course the numbers did not show up, but maybe you can just count down or pick a, pick a situation that you're interested in discussing. That would be fine too. But you see in the chat, you see all these, these situations where we usually rely on the police to solve the situation. And so choose one, let's just say you choose one and that's fine. Let's say you choose you're experiencing intimate partner violence. And then with your partners in your small group, discuss, hey, what's the root cause of this conflict issue or question? And what would be, what do you think would be the best approach to reacting to it in a life-affirming care-centered way? And then what is the type of solution that could help prevent this from occurring in the future? And that's just a way we can begin to imagine what some of these alternatives can be. And I see it's about three after, this is perfect. So like, Phil, if you wanna put everybody into, um 10 small groups and then we'll take about 15 minutes in the group and then we can come back does it is that clear does everybody get that any questions okay great thank you all and i hope that you'll stick around for the small group sometimes that's some of the most fun so how were your discussions i'd love if anybody felt like they had a great discussion and wanted to just share some of the thoughts you came up with, I'd love to hear them. Would somebody like to volunteer? Yeah. Nancy, were you going to say something? Uh, well, um, not really, but I could say that. Um, <laughs> I ended up in a group of two with an old friend. <laughs> and so mm. that was fun, but uh, we did kind of get sidetracked into old friend uh, talk. But um, <laughs> he tells me that he is the eccentric one in a situation. He is the one that the police stopped to say, don't stand on the railroad tracks, walk over to the bus stop. But that's what they do. This is in Ann Arbor. and. Um, <laughs> And I live in Oberlin, Ohio now, although I had, after graduating from Oberlin College, we lived uh, 30 years in Chicago in Hyde Park on the South Side, and then 20 years in Columbia, Missouri, and now back in Oberlin. And each place Mm -hmm. is rather different in terms of policing. Mm -hmm. And, but we were in Chicago during the time of community policing, or at least attempts for that. And we were pleased Mm -hmm. with that. Um, 
We had several cars stolen while we were in Chicago and all our relationships with police were good. I did have a couple of impromptu situations. One was when I was downtown walking to work and there was a man sleeping on the park bench who was there pretty much every day. And the police came and started to grab him off. And I just jumped in without thinking and said, no, I know him. <laughs> Good for you. And, and the police, the police pulled back and left. Wow. But, but everything, the few things I've done like that have just been even without thinking, you know, it's just like. Yeah. Following you know. your gut instincts. Yeah. Right. Right. I love it. I love it. Well, you've given us a great prompt there. Thank you for sharing that. I wonder okay. um, who, was there a group that had, was discussing about folks sleeping on benches in the park? And did you have some other ideas? Who was in that group? <laughs> did you get any good solutions? I, I, w I was one of the members and, and, and uh -huh. my other two partners, I, I know from from our meeting, so um, I have to confess we did not, we we talked about our experiences <clears throat> with with the police and where we have lived a lot. Uh, we yeah. we did we did not deal with that That's question. All right. That's all right. That's no problem. Let's just see if there's anybody if anybody if maybe people didn't really address the questions and that's fine. Um, but did anybody in your small group have an idea about a different approach to dealing with these issues? Anybody want to share? Jessica? Um, we didn't have, uh, we were in group, there are two of us in group four. And so mm -hmm. we were experiencing intimate partner violence, a domestic violence situation. And, and, and I have to say that we did struggle to come up with approaches that didn't involve police. Um, but we really thought that one of the important things to do would be for um, the person experiencing the violence to have a way to put some physical space distance between the two. Um, and then maybe you would be able to figure out what triggered that. Um, it could be a lot of different things and it might be a uh, might be a one-time thing um, or there mm -hmm. might be a pattern there but um, two ideas were like in, in the county that I live in there's a there's a, a a local a county shelter for women and children that are experiencing violence and I feel like it's pretty well known um, you know so so people know um, that that's a place that's available to them and then um, Joe mentioned that sometimes getting away can have, you, you might need money to be able to like get away, even, even yeah. get away just for a short time. And he mentioned that his, his dad had put aside a little bit of money for all the kids so that if they needed something like that and sort of an emergency, but also sort of a safety fund to, yeah. you, you won't want to be trapped in a domestic partner violent relationship because of finances, you know, but if you can yeah. break, if you can at least make an initial physical break, there might be ways that you could get the, the partner to see a social worker or, or, or some counseling of some sort um, to see if that is, is a situation that can be, um, you know, resolved in some way or or at least learn that no that that violence is going to continue and therefore it does need to you need to uh you need to sever that relationship so that you can keep safe but having having yeah. a little bit of money and a little bit of physical space in some way um in and we also talk i mean i, I mentioned it, it used to be that sometimes situations like that would happen and people would mention it to their pastor and the, you know, mm -hmm. so the church, mm -hmm. the church might, might reach out 
uh, like, Hey, what's going on, you know, so, sort of thing. But I don't know if that happens much in faith communities anymore, but it used to be a mm. role that happened mm-hmm. in a faith community, as opposed to dumping it on, onto the police. Um, yeah. Right, right away. Was- and, and, and Great. if you have family nearby, family can be a, a way to put some physical space between you and the partner. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, those are all such, I mean, it, it shows the complexity of all these issues, right? Um, so you mentioned so many different like uh, interception points, uh, different roles within the community uh, that could that could help a situation like this. Um, and because we're running out of time, I'm just going to jump to um, this set of memes, which I love these really, if you Google uh, imagine dot, 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 isn't that public safety? You'll see a whole set of these things. And I'll just, you know, we can just look at a couple of them, but like they're, they have, they also did what, uh, something around intimate partner violence. And they said, well, what if you could text a number and a trauma informed crisis intervention specialist meets you in a safe place. And an hour later, you're working together to make a safety plan with that person. Like, right. It's just, that would be somebody who has the skills who could help you. You, all you need to do is text this number. You're, you're connected with somebody. Gun violence is definitely something I worry about in my community. And I'm sure many other people do too. Um, You know, what if a trauma informed crisis intervention team would work with community activists to activists to disarm and deescalate conflicts. Uh, and that people who are doing that harm is, are connected to services that un- address the underlying problem. That's part of what we're trying to get with some of our questions is that a lot of these things are connected to underlying problems that we as a society have decided not to address, right? Um, <clears throat> so there's lots of these things. We've already talked about the mental health responder thing. I've heard things as simple as um, in Las Vegas, one of our colleagues was telling us that um, some people were putting together like a tail light, uh, community tail light clinic so that if you had a tail light out, you could come up and get your tail light uh, replaced at no cost, uh, so that you weren't pulled over by the police. Which is one of the, you know, traffic stops for uh, folks of color have been, ended in tragic ways. So there's like a lot of different ways that we could address some of these things. And uh, you know, I'll just share with you in AFSC, we're we're trying to we're trying to be part of creating this new way of thinking about thinking about and doing things. And um, I wanted to just share with you as, as a way of going out that um, we're entering into a new 10 year strategic plan, um, but we also in the Healing Justice Network, which my work is part of, we've got this beautiful North Star visionary document that covers all of these issues that you kind of see underneath that at the, at the bottom including, um, you know, the policing issue, but we also talk about uh, transformative justice and public health and community reinvestment. You know, so we're, again, invest, divest. We're trying to reduce the scope of the punishment paradigm and build up beautiful transformative ways of, you know, human-centered healing that we can all be part of. And I want to just extend an invitation to any of you that uh, my friend Lewis and I have been going to a lot of Quaker meetings and doing a little presentation on the North Star document and chatting with people about the ideas in there. So I just wanted to say, hey, if you want to invite us, we'd love to come and talk with your meeting. Uh, and I'll, um, okay. What's that? Oh, sorry, anyway, I'll put um, my email in the chat if anybody would like to get a hold of me, but I think we're about at time. And I just want to thank you all uh, for your time and for being here and all the great, you had so many wonderful um, stories and uh, insight. I really appreciated the time with you. So uh, thanks again. And I hope to be in touch again. Take care. Mary, thank Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Take care, everybody.